welcome to The Report Card, where we evaluate efforts to improve the lives of families, schools, and students. It's no secret that the world of American higher education has increasingly come under fire in recent years. Concerns over rising tuition costs, workplace readiness of graduates, and inequitable admissions practices have become increasingly widespread and vehement. Well, in 2011, Ben Nelson founded a fascinating new college from scratch. The San Francisco-based Minerva has a goal of disrupting the status quo in higher education and creating the world's premier university. Ambitious? Sure. But with its innovative interdisciplinary curriculum, distinctive pedagogical vision, and an acceptance rate lower than Harvard's, Minerva is a wildly ambitious attempt to reimagine the undergraduate experience. In this episode of The Report Card, I asked Ben Nelson to come on to discuss the Minerva model and his vision for higher education. Ben, thanks for coming on The Report Card. What a pleasure to be here. So I want to get to Minerva and what it is and your vision and all that, but let's get to some first principles first with some simple questions. Ben, what should universities do? Well, the American university was conceived as the guarantor of liberty. And that may sound strange, right? You may think, oh, well, you know, we live in a representative republic and that's just how it is and we just have that in that right. That's not what our founding fathers thought. Our founding fathers thought that in order for people to be sovereign, for them not to be subjects of a king, they had to be trained in the disciplines or arts that allowed them to have freedom or liberty. That's what a liberal arts means. And their vision was that enfranchised citizens would have a liberal arts education such that they can actually be participating in democracy and, more importantly, when called upon to serve, they can transfer their practical knowledge, as Franklin called it, or useful knowledge, as Jefferson called it, from their day-to-day careers into this new career of service. Okay, so that makes sense. But let's translate that into a little bit of the the here and now. I mean. Let me ask the inverse. What do universities do now, and how does it measure up against those sort of lofty ambitions? Unfortunately, universities in the United States, rather than reforming higher education around the world, have in many ways regressed to a degraded version of what the rest of the world does. In countries where universities predated the current governments, right, that were basically in Europe born from monarchies or from the church, Those universities disseminate information. They train you to be somebody who can build a bridge in service of the king or somebody who can be a doctor in service of the king or somebody who can be a priest in service of the cross. Right. Right. And so those are highly narrow, specific goals. And that's what American universities have become. And I say degraded because... Unlike in the European model, where you'll spend three years doing nothing but one particular subject, in the United States, you'll spend maybe 40 or 50 percent of your time of four years doing that subject. And then in the nod to the liberal arts goal, but not really in its implementation, you take a bunch of totally random courses that you feel like, basically edutainment. And then you call it, oh, you're now getting a liberal arts education. And the reality is you're just being participating in more of that information dissemination. And by the way, this is not a term that I make up. If you go and ask almost any university president, give me the shortest version of the mission statement of a university, they say we exist to create and disseminate information. That is, or create and disseminate knowledge, as they say. And that's what they believe their perspective. Create, of course, on the research side, which, you know, obviously, if you do good research, that's an important thing. And disseminate in the sense of the teaching side, even though dissemination of information should be done online for free. Sure. And that teaching side is organized a little bit like a smorgasbord in a lot of universities. And, of course, there's a lot of other things that don't even sort of get to this entire area, like, you know, did you know universities have football teams? You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing because when you think about what universities actually do, I've always been criticized because when I've always talked about universities, I start with what they do in education. 
Right. And most people, when they talk about universities, say, well, wait a second. Everybody knows you don't learn anything at universities. Universities are about football and hanging out and clubs and Greek life and things like that. And yeah, yeah you kind of have to go to class, but nobody actually goes. You basically take the test and you pass. Sure. Yeah. I, in fact, my question was, you know, I was sort of hoping that you'd get into right away, say, well, you know, they spend all this money on what? Lazy rivers and uh, university largesse and, you know, the NCAA. But yeah, you did go to the education yeah. idea, which is great because th- this is an education podcast. And, 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 you know, and actually these are, are related because if a university were to actually commit to its educational mission, if it took its educational mission seriously, guess what? There wouldn't be Lazy Rivers and NCAA and all of those things because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit if a university is actually committed to developing the intellect of their students. We think about universities as being a long time. Four years is nothing. To reshape a mind fundamentally, to actually give tools so that people can understand the world from different perspectives, not in one field but in anything they encounter – You can't do that and be a professional athlete. And let's not kid ourselves. College athletes are professionals, you know, training and working 60 hours a week. Doesn't work. There's no room for it. Right. Yeah. So let's get to Minerva and flesh some of these things out a little bit. And Minerva is an effort. You correct me if I'm wrong. I think Minerva is sort of an effort to recreate the institutional architecture of universities Mm -hmm. through a tech platform, but not just to cut lop off some of the waste, but also to refocus the animating element is refocusing the true purpose of a liberal arts degree. But before that, I want to get to two quick questions. Can you remind our listeners, who is Minerva? Sure. Minerva was the Roman goddess of wisdom, the arts, and just wars, the wars that had to be fought for the sake of humanity. Yeah. I'm for just wars, but not the other kind. The reason I ask is, isn't that sort of a funny name for a a modern tech-based university, a futuristic vision? Yeah, so it's actually really interesting because, you know, I always describe Minerva as radically progressive reactionaries. We believe in classical values. We believe in classical ideals, the ideals of the Enlightenment, the ideals of freedom and the sovereignty of people as opposed to institutions. And at the same time, those ideals were lofty and really unattainable. One of the reasons liberal arts education never really lived up to its original promise is the delivery mechanism of shifting how a mind works really can't be done if you are doing it in an uncoordinated way. And coordinating a study of various topics and different frameworks taught by different professors across different groupings of students simply can't be done without data. And so what we have today is this incredible opportunity to use technological tools, data-mediated environments, to fulfill that initial vision that really our republic is based on. So that's good. Again, Lofty, let's bring this down to brass tacks. Tell me what Minerva is. Give me the short version. I'll ask about some details. Sure. So Minerva, as you said, reimagines the entire university experience. And so... From the way that we select students, which is purely meritocratic, there is an absolute bar, and anybody who passes that bar is offered admissions, despite the fact that we're super selective, the bar is set very high, to what we teach, a set of four systems of thinking that represent the way the world actually works, and 80 component parts of those systems that you can then learn to apply in radically different fields so that it's knowledge which is broadly useful as opposed to theoretical, to how we teach rather than lecturing at students. We make sure that they do deep processing and deep engagement throughout their time and where we teach, which is rather than secluding them away in some leafy campus, actually getting to live in the real world and experience everything the world has to offer. Okay. So where do the students live? So The students will spend their first year in San Francisco, where we're based, in a residence hall right downtown, and they'll have their beds and bathrooms and kitchen, Right, and that's it. No cafeteria, no gym, no lawns, no fancy libraries, no giant buildings. They use the city as their campus. And then after the first year, they will travel as a group. 
and live in six cities around the world, learning and experiencing from the world itself. And so they'll spend a semester in Korea, a semester in India, a semester in Germany, a semester in Argentina, a semester in the UK, a semester in Taiwan before coming back for a month to San Francisco for their graduation. Right. And this isn't sort of study abroad for a semester. This is a progression where you sort of see the world. Okay, I get that. But that doesn't tell me a whole lot about what class is like. We often think about it like, so what does a Minerva class look like? Yeah. So the Minerva class is very different than the class that most people have ever experienced. Even though all the students live together, they don't get together in a physical room for class. When it's time for class, any class they take, we'll meet twice a week for 90 minutes per session, just like in a typical university. But they open their laptop and they train their webcam directly at their face because all of our classes are very small, 12 to 18 students per class. But they are done via live video. So the professor and all the students, even if they're living five feet away from one another, will be conducting class in this data-mediated environment. In the class, the professor doesn't lecture. In fact, professors aren't allowed to talk for more than four minutes at a time. The point of the class is that the professor is engaging students and challenging them to apply what they did in their homework and their reading, and there's a lot of preparation work before right. class, and apply it in novel contexts. And so it's not that even a professor asks a student a question and everybody else is listening. If one student is engaged in one particular answer, the other students are already thinking about the counter argument or a different perspective because they know they're about to be called on next. And this sort of looks like what, the Brady Bunch home screen where you have a bunch of faces looking at each other and one of them is the professors? Is that right? Effectively. Yeah. But there are also other areas within the, the environment that facilitates the educational model. So, for example, the, there could be, you know, joint workbooks, simulations. Pre, you know, sometimes you'll be looking at certain materials that you're sure. discussing, polls, chat functionality, et cetera. And so even though a lot of the, well, the entire class is involved with talking and participating, there are also other things that make that discussion richer. Okay. So a lot of people that will hear about this will say, oh, they're just doing MOOCs, right? <laughs> so MOOCs are massive open online courses. They were all, they were going to revolutionize Higher education back in, what, 2010, that so far has not happened. Right. How are they different from these, you know, massive open yeah. online courses? So think of MOOCs as what happens when technology meets a lecture, right? It's actually better than a lecture, but it's like saying that you are making a sugar pill better, right? Maybe it's smaller and it goes down easier, but it's still a placebo. It doesn't work, right? right? Lectures are... A professor standing in front of a class disseminating information. Guess what? Harvard students, six months after the end of a lecture and test-based class, retain 10% of the information. Students at other universities will retain 5 to 8%. So part of the difference that you're drawing is that lectures, just as the medium of information exchange, are a bad medium. Terrible. Yeah. And MOOCs effectively, funny enough have exposed how bad lectures are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've slightly improved upon them, but they're still not great, right. right? Think of what Minerva does as the 15-person round table, the intimate, deep conversation, but better, right? And so what MOOCs were to lectures, right? A slight improvement over a very flawed model. Minerva is in many ways on steroids for a seminar, taking what is a more effective model and making it vastly more effective. Right. So I've read a little bit about this, but there are – so it's a platform, right? It's a technology platform. You sign in, and that's how you go to class. And that platform also enables the professor to break people into groups, to work separately, and do a lot of different functionalities that are – totally different from a lecture format. Right? Exactly. So it's not just, oh, we talk more right. back and forth. It's actually a different functionality in the system. Exactly. You can do things on in a Minerva classroom that you simply cannot do offline, even in small group settings. Right. And I'm assuming you can also not only break people into groups, but you can also send the simulations or whatever might accompany that, the materials, the curricular materials with them. But 
I mentioned curriculum, so let me ask you, how does the curriculum differ? And let me ask you to start with these four cornerstone courses. Yeah. What and why? Sure. So in your first year, everybody takes their core general education requirements, and there's no choice. We teach these four frameworks of thinking. Every university you you will encounter will tell you on their website when their president speaks to you, et cetera, they'll say, oh, we teach you how to think critically, and we'll teach you how to think creatively and solve problems and communicate effectively. But when you actually ask them, well, great, that's obviously what universities should do. How do you do that? They say, well, you know, we'll teach you chemistry and history and math, and you'll learn the other stuff by accident. Right. Well, if you, you learn the other stuff by accident, why are you saying that that's the primary thing you need to do? That's like saying I'm going to, you know, teach you how to ice skate and, you know, we'll start by teaching you how to watch TV. Literally nothing to do with one another. Right. And it, there is some sense behind why they would advertise the one, sort of the idealized form, right. and then have specific instances that are disciplinarily narrow right. and supposed to have that in because the ideal form is what everybody wants. Everybody wants to think critically. Exactly. But actually laying it down in a single course. Now, and I want to ask you this as well, because if you did this as a university president yeah. and said, everyone must take this course because it is the fundamental way of seeing the world that we need to teach. You get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Correct. Do you not get into a lot of trouble, Ben? No, because we don't say take this one course. Because we have a full year of providing empirically proven ways of thinking, not a way. We don't teach somebody how to think in a way. We give them frameworks of thinking that they can apply in different ways. Okay, so right. give me an example of these frameworks. Sure. So much of what we think about when we think about critical thinking is really formal systems, analysis of algorithms, logic, reasoning, use of statistics. Not a lot of people would argue that that's a bad set of skills to have in your back pocket, especially if you can apply them across disciplines. But then there's a different way of looking at the world, which is more empirical. It's what social scientists do, what regular scientists do, natural scientists do. You observe the world. You have data that's often messy. It's not just something that you can put through an algorithm. So you have to understand what aspects of it can I look at formally and what aspects of it are still unclear. What is the difference between a claim and a fact? What's a level of comfort with a hypothesis that I work through? How do I go about solving a problem and creating that hypothesis, getting to the core of what the problem that needs to be solved as opposed to dealing with symptoms? So those are empirical systems. Of, of looking at the world. Then there's a way of looking at the world, which is the way the world actually operates, because we don't live in a theoretical world. We right. don't live in a world of just what we can observe. We live in a world of complex systems of complexity, societies, human interactions, markets, political systems, legal systems, organic systems, bodies. These are complex systems. They are all governed by a set of fascinating rules that have to do with chaos and emergent properties and second and third order effects, et cetera. And so learning to look at the world in that lens is crucial. And then lastly, there's the representation world that we actually live in, the world of communications. We talk to one another. We interact with one another. We actually represent everything we observe in these other systems in this vocabulary. And being able to be able to navigate that is crucial. Notice Everything I have said, nobody can object to. Right. Nobody can say, oh, you shouldn't learn how to communicate or, oh, thinking critically, that's terrible. Right. right? Or, oh, you don't need to understand the observed world or the world of, of systems. There's nothing political about it. There's nothing contextual about it. What I don't say is you must understand the world of oppression or you must understand that, you know, Western society is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Yeah, you humanity. definitely steer clear of those things. From your description, yeah. and I don't know the names of these four courses, but I'm going to guess, are the four courses formal systems and analysis, complex systems and communications? And empirical More or less? Systems. And empirical yeah, systems. That's okay. True. So I get that. And I think that has a framework that then after your first year, I'm assuming you try and use these 
sort of ways of understanding, frameworks for understanding the world in more disciplinary contexts. Exactly. And, and you and you not only use them, you get assessed. So the 80 component parts of these four systems are then assessed all four years. So your first year grades don't get finalized until you graduate. And you apply all of these frameworks in dozens of different fields throughout your time at Minerva. Interesting. So even though you major and you have depth of understanding, beginning in your first year, you're sampling and applying it to all of these different areas. And that, by the way, is why we can teach critical thinking. Because when you try to teach critical thinking in one discipline, the brain does not have the capacity to transfer from one discipline to another. Scientists have shown this for years. Most universities read that data as giving up. They're saying, oh, well, you can't teach general critical thinking, so don't bother. What they don't realize is that the reason that people have not been able to do that in a university environment is because university environments are fundamentally contextual, meaning you study the subject matter and right. the tools are subordinate versus conceptual, which is what we do, whereas you study the tools and then you apply them to whatever context you come across. So I'm interested in this because the structure that you're bringing to Minerva is fundamentally different, not just in sort of the disciplinary blocks when you take modern poetry and modern China and Japan for your history course and so forth, but you have these first principal courses and you track the execution of those courses repeatedly. So the you said the grades don't get finalized, and that's because you're actually evaluating the progression students make on those frameworks for understanding all the way through the courses. So this exactly. suggests to me that you can actually connect the way different courses across all the blocks subsequently are actually working because, you know, sort of like you said, the conceptual tasks are monitored and extended throughout the entire curriculum as opposed to, we'll give you a final exam at the end of the course. Exactly. And this actually gets to the heart of why it is that we conduct our classes via video as opposed to in a room. Because when you're doing things in a data-mediated environment, your professor can go back and watch a recording of the class and then give you feedback. That answer you gave was brilliant in thinking about the right problem, but it was terrible at thinking of the levels of analysis. You looked at it in one perspective as opposed to looking at it from multiple levels. Right? That's how you actually help develop a mind. And that's why a data-mediated environment is so crucial for effective education. Okay, so let me ask you sort of a fundamental question here. Let's say that you are, I don't know, the University of Tennessee, and you buy into this, right? Can you go halfway with sort of the brick-and-mortar university structure? I mean, is there any sort of halfway to do this? Because it certainly sounds that... You need a data-mediated environment to do it and probably also to connect all the conceptual work that you want to link across a large variety of classes. Is there a halfway? There is. So the Minerva model is the ideal instantiation. And so that means that our first year is eight deep courses, four full-year courses, an enormous amount of work, 80 different concepts, fully scaffolded through every course that you take in the future. University could come to us and say, my God, this is a dream. This is what we wanted to do, but we cannot afford to do so much. We don't have room in the curriculum. Give us four courses, just your first year. And what we'll do is we'll modularize the curriculum, enable a university to implement a version of it, the essence of these systems. And then rather than making the, every professor at the university reteach their courses and all the rest, what you could do very easily is to say, look, for every course that you take from now on, there's going to be one assignment that will swap out, right? And you can do it at the end of the semester. You could do it towards the end, in the middle. And that is to say, write a paper, four or five page paper, explaining how you apply the habits of mind and foundational concepts that you learn in these initial four courses in this particular course. How did they benefit your understanding of this field? And now you grade that paper in the same data-mediated environment, because the same way we grade assignments, right. right? We actually have that those scores, and you have a living index 
and track student progress even though you do everything else separately. So if it takes 32 courses to graduate from a university, you give us four courses, about 10% of those classes, and an assignment for each one of those other classes that, that professors will grade, and you get a large chunk of the benefit. Right. It's and not, you're ha- so you're halfway there. So you can see there. the you can see the course. Exactly. Okay. I just cracked my coffee cup. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, come on. There's a rule that says do not bring drinks in here. Matt. This is totally your fault. Well, let's talk about some of the operations standpoints. Why even have campuses at all? For a number of reasons. So, one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier is is this idea of transfer, right? Where you learn a certain concept and you apply it, for example, in different fields. But we don't just live in a world of academic fields. We live in the real world. And guess what? Figuring out what the essence of a problem is in a startup town like San Francisco, where everybody's obsessed with solving problems, may be a little bit different than in Seoul, Korea, or in Hyderabad, India, right? Or in London, Right? There are different approaches based on the context in which you live. And it's very, very hard to understand the context of the world if you only understand one lens. Okay, so let me ask you about the flip side of that, maybe. A lot of people, including me, I think, so I went to a liberal arts college and sort of had a pretty liberal artsy experience. One of the greatest things that I got out of that was the the community, both with professors, but also with, with students, people that I know now. That's a big part of college for a lot of people. And I think it's a very valuable part of college. Is Minerva leaving that on the cutting room floor? Not at all. So remember, all the students not only live together, live in a residence hall in the middle of San Francisco, but in the first year, but then when they travel around the world, they travel together. So you are effectively with the same group of 150 or so students all four years, developing an extremely tight bond. It's actually most akin to what happens when you do an MBA, right? And you have a section of 90 students and you take all of your classes together, you know, you interact and you're friends for life, right? And so that type of experience is very, very, very tight. And you get to know your professors really well because remember... 100% of your classes are fewer than 20 students. Right. Every professor will know your name. They'll know about you. People go to office hours. Professors visit the cities. And so you sometimes get that kind of interaction. And so students develop a really close bond, not only with their fellow students, but also with their professors. But so so the living environment, and part of this is going to be a function of small scale, right? But also, it's just different from sort of the grab bag of the large university where you're living with thousands of people spread across thousands. You know, it's just the combinatorial factors are just too big to actually build community except in these informal ways. Okay. Talk to me about costs. Is part of the value proposition we can do it better and we can do it cheaper? Or is it just we can do it better and it's going to be expensive? No, it is is certainly the former, right? In the sense that, again, remember, we're the only university, at least that I know of in the United States, that can guarantee that you will never take a class of more than 20 students in in a class. It just doesn't exist. And so you get a much more intimate education, yet forget room and board, you have to pay to live. That's the same as any other university. But tuition and fees at university at Minerva are only about $15,000, one five, not 50. Right. And so we are less than a third of the cost of our quote unquote peer institutions, the highly selective private universities that are out there. And why is that? Because even though you get this amazing education, this incredible lived experience, you don't have to pay for the football team and the libraries and the lawns and, you know, the buildings that are crumbling and falling apart and they have to invest more money to prop them back up, you know, pay for professors to not teach you and go and do research, et cetera. You pay for a dramatically improved educational experience, a dramatically improved living lived experience, but you don't have to pay for all of the frills that you barely use. Right. So it's arguably cheaper, but it's not necessarily cheap. It's not a bargain option either. I mean, you have no. serious costs and you got to pay for the education. Correct. Yeah. So so the – Which I don't think is a bad thing. No, no. It, it, is, right? it like, is just the a The cost reality. of something is a reflection of its value in Correct. some ways. Correct. It is the reality of, of, you know, professors do need to get paid. They do. Right. And they should be paid well. Right. right? Because if they do a great job – 
they are doing one of the most important roles in society. And let's talk about those professors. Where do you find them? Because you need a bunch of them, and I'm interested also in sort of their loads and their backgrounds, and so just give us a bit on that. Yeah, so we are extremely fortunate that universities decide to massively overproduce PhDs, meaning that they I think if universities had to eat their young, right, if they had to hire yep. all the PhDs that they themselves produce, they would have to fire the entire professoriate every two years. Right. That's bad for the labor market, but it's great as far as our ability to go out and find exceptional, exceptional professors with phenomenal backgrounds that understand and are excited by our educational mission. And so the process of finding these professors, we're actually as selective with finding professors as we are with our students. We have about a 1% acceptance rate of professors who apply to Minerva. But I would also expect that you have a different selection function because a lot of professors will say, well, I'm going to do this research that... That's right. You know, Minerva sounds like to me doesn't much care about, whereas in the typical universities, that research agenda is sort of, well, R1 universities, that's yeah. that's primary. And then your teaching load, well, if you can get it paid for, you don't teach. Right. And if you can't, then I don't want to say it's secondary, but sometimes it's secondary. Secondary uh, if you're lucky. It's usually tertiary. Right. Yeah. And so by going out and looking for instructing professors, right. you're sort of selecting for different A- Absolutely. Now, we have... Many of our professors do research and do very good research. Right. But we don't need to emphasize that. Right. Universities are focused on research because this is how they get pride of place. Right. And they ignore education because education doesn't actually generate or accrue any kind of prestige benefits to the institution, sadly. We know that because the field of being a professor already emphasizes research so much, We institutionally don't need to emphasize it. They have a natural incentive to do research. And so what we look for are people who are truly passionate about shaping the minds of the people who are going to have the future of humanity in their hands. And when professors understand that awesome responsibility, that they actually have an opportunity to get a future president, prime minister, senator, CEO, cultural leader, leading scientist. Nobel Think Prize, tank scholar. Think tank scholar. Okay. Horse, journalist, right? <laughs> These are folks who influence the world, right? And your ability to actually help them have tools to think more systematically and therefore make better decisions when they're in that position is so crucial, far more so than getting them to think the way you think. Sure. Or and, getting them to believe what you believe. And I started out by saying, you know, I think Minerva looks like uh, an effort to recreate the institutional architecture. And this is a big differentiator in the institutional architecture because for R1 universities, that research and that grant funding that comes along with it is a big part of the institutional engine. And it is something that Minerva's model has pretty much completely offloaded. Is that right? Correct. A hundred percent. Why are you for profit? Well, the university is a nonprofit. Okay, so the university is a yeah. nonprofit. The university is All a right, nonprofit. All right, so help me out here. Uh, yes. What's not? What, what's what, for what profit? What is for profit? Right. So, in order to build that engine, the technology that enables this kind of curriculum, in order to rethink the approach to education, to marry the best of learning science and the best of Silicon Valley technology, you need it to hire engineers. You needed to actually hire amazing academics. You had to provide them incentives. And guess what? Nonprofits don't do this well. Right. right? If you think about any technology that you use, almost certainly it was not built by a nonprofit. Right. Right. It was built by a corporation because corporations actually can compete for all kinds of talent. Academic institutions can very effectively compete for great academics. You don't need to have a profit motive to teach. You don't have to have a profit motive to provide mental health services and to provide student experience opportunities or to think through admissions or to think through visa processing and things like that. That is a field that understands that their mission is to help social mobility, to help people who would otherwise not have access to education in the best circumstances, which we take very seriously. And that is fundamentally a nonprofit mission. Right. And the university embraces those missions. 
Correct. But Very much the so. the platform is but, doing a different thing. Correct. The platform's job is to actually build and perfect that environment and then enable other learning environments to take advantage of it. That university in Tennessee that you mentioned that says, oh my God, we we actually do care about our students. We actually do want to see our students learn in a fundamental way. We can't blow up our campus. We can't just, you know, change everything, but we'd like a piece of what Minerva has. They need to be able to work with a competent provider, right, that can make sure that the service is up and running all the time, sure. that they get the best type of response, etc., which means that it has to be a corporation. And, and just another thing to layer on here is, even if you wanted to do it as a nonprofit, and even if the incentives didn't align up, Getting VC funding to start such an enterprise Impossible. as a nonprofit is just never. You cannot find an angelic enough investor to, that <laughs> to do that. All right. So real quick, you have not been an education guy all the time, right? You spent 10 years as an executive and ended up CEO at Snapfish, right? right? Which is a .com publishing company that On I have company, used yep. and mm -hmm. so forth. I'm curious, what did you learn at Snapfish and in that environment that helped you in developing Minerva and this sort of vision for education? So when I took over Snapfish, I worked at Snapfish before the service even launched. And I saw how it went from a concept to a really effective company, effectively working in the United States. When I took over as CEO, we were operating just in two countries in the United States and the UK. We just launched a UK service. We were really just operating a direct-to-consumer site, right. worked with some partners, but on a co-branded basis. But when I was done being CEO, five and a half years later, we worked in 21 different countries. We Our volume grew by 20x. We went from 127th to market when we started to global number one, five times the size of our next closest competitor. But most importantly, we did it because we leaned into complexity. We we're able to operate a direct-to-consumer and serve the largest photo finishers in the world. We were able to operate a service in the United States and to operate services all over the world in four different continents. What was fascinating was that in every one of those contexts, so in the 22 countries that we were operating in, if you looked at our biggest competitor in every country, that was 21 different top competitors. The only two countries where the biggest competitor was the same was in the UK and France, where the biggest competitor in the UK of ours merged with the biggest competitor in France. Otherwise, we would have 22 separate competitors. Gotcha. And so the ability to understand how to actually hone your offering when you work directly with consumers or in the concept of education, when you serve students directly and hone what it is that you do, you then can offer that expertise and approach to others that are trying to do the same thing, understanding that the context in which they operate is different. Sure. So how do you bring that kind of scale to Minerva? <laughs> I mean, so, and the question really is, you know, what's the future? What do you see for Minerva, the university itself, and also for the platform? The platform is really the way that we scale Minerva's impact. The university is, for lack of a better word, a way for us to demonstrate to the world that universities can be done fundamentally better in every respect. And the corporation is there to help those institutions reform based on that model. So the future of the university is to enable the rest of the world to constantly see not only the best instantiation of what education is today, but how even being in that position, we don't rest on our laurels. Every year, we get better and better and better. We go through and revise our courses. We revise our student experience. We rethink the institutional structure all the time because we are relentless in doing what we believe is the most important job in the world, which is training the next generation. And the corporation then enables other universities to say, okay, we see and appreciate what you can do in this environment. How do you translate what you're doing over there to what we want to do here? 
How do we take our own view of a curriculum using your philosophy? How do we think through a global exposure for our students, but given the constraints that we have with our own system, et cetera? And that's, and that's how we scale and have broad-based impact. And that, by the way, won't be a 10-year journey. It'll be a 50-year journey, and I'm excited to have it. Well, Ben, you're nothing if not ambitious. Minerva is a fascinating platform and university. Appreciate you coming on the report card to talk to us about it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the report card with Nat Malkus, and special thanks to our guest, Ben Nelson. I also want to thank the producers that make this podcast possible. That includes Nathan May, Matt Rice, Tyler Hoover, and Gage Hurley of Liquid Media. You can subscribe to the report card on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, take a minute and give us a review so other folks can find the show. If you have comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes, drop me a line at ed.podcast at AEI.org. Thanks for listening, and I'm signing off for this episode. I'm Nat Malkus. <laughs>